you did not get a paper, raise your hand. We'll make sure you get one. I think I got everybody. Uh, you got to supply your own pens. If you don't have a pen, just holler. You got a pen? Anybody else need a pen? I'll, I don't have any more. <laughs> but uh, Jeremy will give you one if you need a pen. You need a pen? Raise your hand. We got some in the cup back there. Okay, we're good. All right, then. I'll see what I can do with see what I can do here without a pen. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 6, we're going to talk about communication. But before we do, I told you that an elephant slept only two hours. This one, this little useful, useless information is about a rhino. I did not know this, but a rhino's horn is made from compacted hair. How many knew that? Okay, how many did not know that? Now you know, okay, now you know. If you didn't learn anything else tonight, you can remember that a rhino's horn is compacted hair. Who he thinks about such not? That's yeah, that's an ingrown hair, right? All right. Uh, the one little correction on your paper, very last line, it should be talking instead of tailing. Okay, number three there at the very bottom of the page. Uh, my typewriter missed the letter K. I think talking to those not ready should be. I think that's the only typo on here. <coughs> and then three things to think about before we pray and get started here. Try to think of some rules regarding musical instruments because we're going to be talking about some basic rules about communication. So we'll be thinking about some rules for musical instruments, some basic rules for real estate, and some basic rules for relationships. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 6 says, Let your speech, your communication, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Let your speech be always with grace. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege to be in church. <coughs> we thank you for your mercy, for your grace. We thank you for your word. And we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit directing us and guiding us through it. And Lord, we pray tonight as we look at this word study, this subject of communication, that we might be more effective communicators when we leave church tonight. We pray that we would be more ready to speak with grace and to speak with a salt seasoning for the world around us certainly needs it. And Lord, we pray that we'll be ready always to give answers to people who have questions about our faith. Help us in this area of communication to be better communicators for your glory. And we'll thank you for the help you give in Christ's name. Amen. Well, since this is on a mic, uh, I can only think of a couple rules about musical instruments. One is, and this is what I remember from high school, that they need to be in tune. Okay, a musical instrument, they're not any good if they're way out of tune. So they need to be tuned up and they need to be clean. Now, Elaine, what's a third general rule about musical instruments that you can think of? Anybody think of a third one? we got to have three because every preacher's got three points. Okay, three points. Who's got a, anybody play the drums? Okay, be used. Yeah, just make sure it's used a lot. Those are some general rules about about musical instruments. How about real estate? Who knows the line about real estate? Three things that are important in real estate. Location, location, and location. That's what they tell us. So, And there's probably some truth to that. <coughs> and then relationships. Well, let me give you three that come to my mind. In our relationships, we've got to reach out. Somebody was asking me this last night about how do we start up a conversation with people who don't want to talk? Well, you start. Just reach out. Don't wait for them to say, hi, good morning. You start, hi, good morning. You know, they might be looking at the ground because they're disappointed. Cheer them up a little bit. Use your, use your speech too. So you reach out, you reach in. That means you reach inside yourself and find something nice to say. And then you, uh, you reach up, you pray about it. So those are the three things about uh, regarding relationships that I find helpful. Uh, relationships, after the quiz there, relationships are the key to evangelism. Now, the four elements of communication, I learned this from speech class way back in college many moons ago. Whenever you communicate, you have a sender. I am right now sending you words. I'm sending you a message. You are the receivers. That's the second part. And then you have the, the message itself which tonight we're going to be starting out in Colossians chapter 3, verse 6. That's the message that I'm sharing. So you have the sender, the receiver, the message, 
And then you have to deal with interference or you have to deal with distractions. And um, some distractions we can handle, sometimes we can handle. Sunday morning during Sunday school, we, uh, Mrs. Uh, Leonhardt had some issues with her medicine. And, 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 you know, she didn't do that on purpose, but here I am trying to teach and you're all looking over there. But that happens, and it happens on occasion. And what we want to do as leaders of a crowd is we want to limit those distractions. We want to limit those interruptions. We want to limit that interference. Uh, in the sport of hockey, you can, you can get a penalty for interference for, for uh, disrupting the game by breaking some of the rules. So those are the four basic elements of communication. The sender, the receiver, the message, and then the, the interference that takes place, okay? Um, many times in sharing the gospel and many times in preaching, and if you want something to pray about Saturday night, pray that satanic interference would be kept out of the morning message because oftentimes when you're sharing the gospel, uh, Satan likes to interfere with the gospel message. On, I would guess out of a dozen times that I've been sharing the gospel, right when I get to the opportunity to pray and ask them to receive Christ, the phone rings, or the pizza delivery man comes, or the dog barks and gets mad at the neighbor cat. There's interference that I believe is satanic. So it's a good thing to try to eliminate that interference through prayer in any way you can. And uh, wives, when you're talking to your husband, eliminate the interference. Husband, when you're talking to your wife, Eliminate the interference. When you're talking to your kids, pay attention. You know, do like my mom. Just grab my hand, squeeze real hard, and get down there eyeball to eyeball. Eliminate the interferences so your child hears clearly what it is you're saying so that they won't get in trouble. Communication defined. Number one, it means to be connected. That's a common phrase today. We all want to be connected with our cell phones and computers and everything else. But to communicate means to be connected. Number two, it means to be ready to talk. Let's communicate. Let's talk about this. To be ready to talk. And three, to impart and transmit and succeed in conveying information. So the word is succeed there for number three. And then number four, it's to relate socially with others. To relate socially with others. Now to go to, go to Philippians chapter 1. Let's see if we can fill in this abbreviated lesson here from Philippians 1, verses 12 through 17. This isn't the only passage in the Bible that talks about communication. It's one of many, okay? This is an abbreviated lesson. Paul had a heart to communicate the gospel effectively. And I have a heart. I, you know, I don't. I don't say that I've got it already, but that's my desire, is to be able to communicate the gospel clearly, and effectively, so that decisions for Christ are made. So, letter A, things happen specifically in Paul's life here for the furtherance of the gospel. The ultimate goal of sharing things with other people, the ultimate goal of communication, is to get the gospel out there. Look at verse number. 12 of our text in Philippians chapter 1. Paul says, but I, but I would, you should understand, brethren, that's anybody who's saved, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. When, when we get together and communicate with others, we talk about all kinds of things. And, and if you're wise and if you're concerned about their soul, you'll transition from talking about things to talking about the gospel. And that takes practice, and that takes discipline, and that takes prayer. But that was Paul's goal, to uh, allow the things that happened in his life to further the gospel. And, uh, you know, Jeremy oftentimes goes with on Tuesday night. I think he's getting tired of hearing all my war stories. But the things that happened in my life molded, molded my life. And some of the things are interesting and some of them are just boring. I usually don't share those. But we start out talking about things. I've been trying to witness a little bit to the fellow doing the siding and, and he's got medical issues at home that he's concerned about and I have medical issues at home that I'm concerned about. So we, we connect on that plane. We talk about those things so we can develop a relationship. 
and hopefully be able to share the gospel. That's what Paul said. Number letter B here in verse 13. Uh, whether we're in the palace or any other place. Look at verse 13. So that my bonds, this is Paul speaking, so that my time in prison, my bonds in Christ are manifest or made known in all the palace and in all other places. I was reading an editorial in the paper by Christy Nome, and she ended the comment, I think it was in the paper, I'm not exactly sure where it was I saw it because it was a couple weeks back, but I remember her using a Bible verse at the end of that letter. And here she is, you know, she's the governor, and she does a lot of business in the in in the house and pier, what do they call that, the, the capital, in the capital building. She does business around all these other politicians. And uh, I'm glad that she's not ashamed of the gospel in a palace. And uh, so any place, Paul says, whether in the palace or in any other place. So we share the gospel with the rich. We share the gospel with the poor. We share the gospel in the capital. We share the gospel in jail. Any place. We ought to be ready to share the truth of God's word. Let her see here. <coughs> we need to communicate boldness to speak or communicate the word without fear. Look at verse 14. <coughs> and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Okay? I don't know about you, but when I, when I get intimidated to share the gospel because I'm shy, people don't think of me as being shy, but there are some times when I'm intimidated and I really don't share the gospel. I don't want to share the gospel with this guy because he looks like he could beat me up. And so to get rid of the fear, to get rid of the fear, I don't know what works for you, but to get rid of the fear for me, I like to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. I like to see what people, Christians before me, had to go through in their witnessing endeavors. And when I, when I read about people that were burned at the stake and boiled alive and skinned alive, then all of a sudden it's not so bad witnessing to my neighbor in Brookings, South Dakota. You know what I'm saying? And God helps us eliminate that fear. We get the spirit of fear from Satan. We read, I think it's 2 Timothy 1, 7. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's where it is. But God has not given us the spirit of fear. The devil did. But God gave us the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And so we try to eliminate the fear when we communicate. Who wants to talk to somebody when you're afraid? I'm not skilled at confronting people when they're wrong, and I'm really not skilled at all at confronting people when they're angry or when they're dangerous. But the Lord will help us as we pray and as we do our best to communicate the word without fear. In verse 15, um, the word there, fill in the blank, some talking causes envy and strife is the word. While some communication creates goodwill. Look at verse 15. <coughs> some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. And some also of goodwill. You know, we're, we're not to lord over people. We're not to beat them over the head with our Bible. Now, they're... As much as we'd like to beat the Bible into them, it just doesn't work. Uh, we had a boy in our Christian school up in Park Rapids who, who memorized word for word the entire Gospel of John. And his first year in Bible college, he was, he was expelled because he couldn't behave. Well, what good does it do to learn the Word of God if you're not going <laughs> to follow through with good behavior? And so what we need to realize is that sometimes, when, all times, I guess, when we share the Gospel, we should be sharing the Gospel with an attitude of goodwill, not just share the gospel so we can argue and strive with people. We don't want to be brawlers. We want to be soft-spoken Bible people that are tender and gracious. There's enough brawlers out there. Aren't you glad Donald Trump is not a preacher? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's it's he had his fun in the White House as a president, but his speech had something to be desired. And so what we need to do is we need to be powerful and strong and confident 
and certainly not be afraid, but let's not create any more strife or brawling because that gets, you know that in a marriage. Where does the brawling get you? All, all it does is make the kids upset. When husbands and wives fight, the kids get scared and hide under the bed. And, and the husband and wife accomplish nothing. So it's very important when you communicate to, to not let envy and strife get in the way there, okay? Do good. That's your goal. Goodwill when you communicate. Letter E here. Contentious is the word. Some talk is contentious and insincere. Look at verse 16. The one preached Christ of contention, right in the text. Not sincerely. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Paul expected his followers and the followers of Christ uh, to avoid arguments because they were foolish. Stand for truth. Contend for truth. Hold your ground. But don't get involved in foolish arguments. Uh, I think Pastor Yoder said the other night in one of his messages that that he's never led anybody to the Lord by winning an argument. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. We have a gift to offer people and the gift of Jesus Christ through the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. And we're to present it to them in a fashion that won't cause them to regurgitate it. They'll, they'll, they'll receive the truth and they'll take it in and they'll trust Christ. So we don't want to be contentious and we don't want to cause strife, letter F here, but we want to be talking in love because in doing that, uh, that helps Paul's purpose, the defense of the gospel. Verse 17. He's talking about, in verse 16, some people preach Christ for contention, and then in verse 17 he says, but other people of love. They, they communicate in a loving fashion. Paul says, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. You can defend the gospel in a loving fashion. Paul did, and we should. We don't have to. We don't have to defend the gospel. You know the abortion issue. We don't defend the gospel by blowing up the abortion clinic. That doesn't solve the thing. It just sends people to jail and hurts people. But uh, holding a sign out in front before they enter the abortion clinic, say, "Please come to our church for counseling," and we can then we can set up. We can offer some help, and we can defend the truth of the gospel. So we need to stand on the truth. We need to stand in the truth. And we need to stand for the truth. But we need to do it in a gracious fashion. And uh, that will yield positive results, I believe. Now, there's four fund foundational guidelines. Did you get A, B, C, D, E, and F there? The words are gospel, palace, fear, strife, contentious, and defense. Let's go to the four foundational guidelines of good communication. Now, uh, the first one is Ephesians 4.15. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 15. We are to speak the truth in love, Paul writes, that we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So, number one there, we must communicate the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15. And then in 1 Corinthians 13.1. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 1, we'll see that effective communication must include charity. 1 Corinthians 13 is the great chapter on love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. My communication gets nowhere if I'm not speaking in love. Uh, it becomes contentious and argumentative and it just adds strife. So I must, I must be, uh, I must include charity. The fourth guideline, foundational guideline, is we must communicate the word in and out of season. 2 Timothy 4.2 is the reference. Give me just a second. 2 Timothy 4. Are you awake, class? Say amen. Okay, good. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season. That's when people like it and they want to hear it. But we also have to preach out of season. That's when they maybe don't like to want to hear it, you know. When your teenage son or daughter says, do I really have to be home by 2 a.m.? Yes, you have to be home by 2 a.m. Because this is my house and I make the rules and I want you home by 11. That, that's not the kind of season, that's not the kind of preaching they like. But yet as a loving parent, we still have to preach out of season. And then we preach in season when they really like it. And what do we preach? Well, we reprove, we rebuke. 
We exhort, but we do it with long suffering. That's another word for patience. We do it patiently, and we do it with sound doctrine. We don't just make a rule because it's a rule. When you make a rule to a teenager and they say, why? You should have an answer. I mean, when they're five years old, you can say, because I said so. Now, go to bed. You can do that when they're five and maybe even when they're 12. But this doesn't, that doesn't work when they're 18. Son, don't smoke marijuana. Why? Do you have an answer? Can you communicate it effectively? Can you communicate it lovingly? Can you give them good reason not to? Because all their friends are telling them it's okay. So do your homework and uh, make your effective communication effective and then do it in season and out of season with patience and with love and with good doctrine. And then the fourth one here is Acts 1.8. Most of you have that memorized. We must let the Holy Spirit help us in our witnessing. I think the biggest mistake I make is witnessing in the flesh. I'm going to straighten that guy out. I'm going to give him the gospel if it kills him. And it usually does kill his relationship with the Lord. It doesn't help at all. But if I, if I pray and ask for the Holy Spirit's help, then I have much better success and much more success. Acts 1.8 But you, receive, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then, the word then isn't in the King James, but I'm, I'm including it here. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, that's Brookings, in all Judea, that's South Dakota, and in Samaria, that's America, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, that's the Philippines and, and Guam and all those other places, okay? But we start at home, and we ask the Holy Spirit to help us as we witness, because that's what communicating the gospel is all about. So number one, we must communicate truth and love. Number two, we must have effective communication. That includes charity. Number three, we must communicate the word in and out of season when they like it and when they don't like it. And we must let the Holy Spirit help us in witnessing. Now, three warnings and reminders in conclusion. Don't you like those two words? In conclusion. If you like those words, say amen. If you don't like those words, go see Jeremy, okay? Three warnings. Let me just give these to you that I think are just, just off the top of my head. I think they're important. Timing. When you communicate, number one, Timing is often critical. The Bible teaches in Ecclesiastes there's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. You know, you don't have to have an answer. You want to end most arguments? Just stop talking. Or if you really want to end an argument with your spouse, just agree with her. You're right, honey. I shouldn't have bought that Volkswagen. <laughs> just, just agree with them. And uh, stop talking. But there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to do with proper timing when we speak. It's not the best time for me tonight to witness to my relatives. But we're having a family reunion in a week. That might be the Lord's time. See what I'm saying? So pray about the, pray about the timing. You know, in a car, if your timing chain breaks, it's major surgery. It's a few dollars. It's expensive. Well, as Christians, we should, we should consider this element of good timing. And when we communicate, we should pray about it. Lord, is this the best time to bring that up? Or maybe I should be silent and uh, ask for the Lord's help there. Secondly, <coughs> talking to those in tunnel vision is very unprofitable. Somehow we need to pray and ask God to silence their selfishness. We need to ask God to remove their tunnel vision because all they're thinking about is themselves. All they're thinking about is their own conclusions. And, and sometimes they're just full of pride. Sometimes the preacher's full of pride. But we want to make sure that pride element is gone. It's not tunnel vision. They only see my way or the highway. You know, the Christian message is not Burger King. <laughs> we, we try to be gentle. We try to have proper timing. We try to let the Holy Spirit help. But we can't tell people, look, this is the this way it is. If you don't like it, get out of here. That doesn't fly very well. We tried that with a couple of my girls when they were teenagers. It backfired. It just doesn't work. It's much better for me to say, honey, I love you. Uh, sit down. Let me tell you why you shouldn't do that. that. That always works better than to say, you know, be angry. That, does, that doesn't help at all. So um, watch out for those in tunnel vision very unprofitable to try to 
talk somebody into something and they have no desire to be talked into it. And then the third one here, talking or communicating to those not ready and willing is often useless. Every Sunday morning or most Sunday mornings, I can't say every because sometimes I probably miss, but my prayer as a pastor on Saturday night and Sunday morning is, Lord, bring some people to church that are hungry. Because if they're not hungry, then I'll have all kinds of interruptions, all kinds of distractions, and nobody will pay attention. But if they are hungry, if they're hungry for the word, if they're hungry for fellowship, you people came tonight, maybe you're hungry for prayer, then things flow well. So, uh, and I pray for my own hunger. When, when Pastor Yoder's preaching and I'm sitting there, I'm praying, Lord, make me hungry for the message. Because if I'm not hungry, I won't take it in. And neither will you. So, that's my challenge for tonight. Did I get all the blanks? Okay. I know you're going to be bitter, but it's four minutes to eight. Do I dare close in prayer and let you out three minutes early? How many are ready to go home? Raise your hand. Okay, we're we'll stand up. We're going to close in prayer there. Okay. <coughs> All right, Alan Staley.